Uh, so today, Tanya will share with us some of the phylogenetic tools uh, a group is developing uh, in order to understand uh, epi epidemiological processes, microevolution, and single cell analysis. So Tanya, thank you again for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction and thanks all for coming. So uh, I would like to, in the next 45 minutes or so, to uh, show you the work of our group, what we're, how, well, the main focus is that we develop phylogenetic tools in order to understand biological processes at all different scales, and today I'll show you examples from Ebola over tuberculosis, stem cells, and uh, penguins. And if there's anything um, unclear during the talk, please uh, feel free to ask. I tried then to remember to repeat the question that our friends online can also follow. So in biology, one basis is that we have reproduction and genetic change. And this reproduction happens on very different scales. So we can have DNA replicating, virions, then prokaryotes, bacteria replicate from new bacteria, eukaryotic cells, say cells in your body, whole eukaryotes we reproduce, but then also whole species reproduce, meaning we have speciation events, so um, we have reproduction in macroevolution, as well as, as well as infected hosts, where one host infects another host, which can be seen as a reproduction event. The pathogen travels from one host to the other host. And this one can illustrate, I guess, with those bubbles. So one bubble is one unit at any of those scales, say um, a eukaryote, this eukaryote reproduces, and then during the production, there may be slight changes in the genome, some mutations, so we may get slightly different offspring, indicated here with slightly different colors. So now when we follow this reproduction process through time, we obtain a lineage tree, meaning we, um, or we display this reproduction process by bifurcation, so in this tree, every bifurcation would be a reproduction, say a speciation event, and then the genetic information characterizing this unit of which undergoes reproduction may change along all the uh, branches in this tree, which we call a phylogenetic tree. And now, one of the aims of, or a key aim of our research is to use this genetic information which we obtain from different organisms, essentially at the tips of this tree, and aim at reconstructing this phylogenetic tree, and with that then understanding this reproduction process, be it macroevolution in species, infected <coughs> hosts would mean understand epidemiology, or any of those other scales. And now I want to walk you through the main applications we work on, so on the different levels of uh, evolution. So the First one, um, where I started actually doing already during my master's thesis back in New Zealand, is on macroevolution, where a phylogenetic tree represents species relatedness, tips being extant species. Here you see um, the human being cl most closely related to chimpanzees, and then based on a time scale, meaning the length of the branches in this tree, you can read off when did the speciation event happen. So between human and chimpanzees, we can read off that roughly six million years ago, there was the speciation event. And people, so now people reconstructed for decades those phylogenetic trees, but what we are really interested in is understanding the dynamics giving rise to those trees. To, so the speciation and extinction rates giving rise to those trees, and in particular are there differences in speciation and extinction rates across different species, which may then become important, say, for conservation biologists who want to know, well, which species are most, more prone to extinction than other species, say, in a changing environment. The second key application of phylogenetic is by now epidemiology. And here again, we have those trees. Now, though, each tip represents an infected host, and branching events are transmission events between infected hosts. And here I should point out that the genetic information, the data we use for reconstructing those trees is now the pathogen data from each infected host. So not the host genetic data, but the pathogen. Meaning, when we reconstruct such phylogenies, 
really um, we reconstruct the ancestry of the pathogen, meaning the transmission history. And, and then similarly, as for <coughs> macroevolution, what we want to understand the dynamics giving rise to those trees, which allow us to understand how do pathogens spread, how quickly do they spread, what can we potentially do to control or even prevent further epidemics. And the third application we work on is on single cells, so um, even a unit kind of smaller. And here I show you an application um, of blood cells. And the phylogenetic trees now really represent single cells dividing. And the cool thing in this application is that you can watch those cells dividing. So compared to epidemiology and microevolution, you don't have to infer the phylogenetic trees, but you can actually observe them. And then you can ask questions like, how, is gene regulation, uh, how are genes regulated along those branches? Or what I'll show you later, um, towards the end of the talk, can we actually identify stem cells by looking at such single cell trees? So, in summary, what we aim is, we want to understand the evolution, so how does the genetic information change, as well as the population dynamics, be it speciation, transmission, cell replication, by looking at those phylogenetic trees. And I want to illustrate the procedure and some of the uh, mathematical uh, background on, uh, with, for those tools in the example of epidemiology, and then later in the talk, mention how we can use such tools also in macroevolution and single cell biology. So in epidemiology, the field of epidemiology is concerned with understanding how do pathogens spread in um, different uh, host populations, in particular one particular um, concern being spreading in humans. And all the examples I'll show you will be pathogens affecting us humans. And so, classically in epidemiology, people used incidence and prevalence data, meaning how many people uh, were sick per week over the course of the epidemic, and then try to understand the dynamics, kind of how fast is or was the epidemic spreading. However, um, there's some limitations to that, which I'll point out in a minute, and uh, phylogenetics can ask similar questions. So, here now, we use genetic sequencing data from the pathogen of different hosts as an input, infer the phylogenetic tree by clustering together similar pathogen sequences and interpret this as the transmission chain. Having in mind, if two people infected each other very recently, the pathogen sequence is most likely very similar because the newly infected individual started with a pathogen from the donor very recently, so there was not a lot of time for mutation, while if there was a transmission event months or years back, there was a lot of time for mutations, so and the two pathogens would be very different and would be very far away in the phylogenetic tree. So now those phylogenetic trees, we take them as proxies for transmission chains, and the first time they become really important in the field of epidemiology, um, I guess, was to um, in assess the question of the emergence of HIV. And so HIV um, was identified in the early 1980s with people dying of AIDS. And then finally in 84, the virus was identified causing AIDS. We call it HIV. But the big question, obviously, was where did this virus come from and when did it start spreading in a human population? Now, with this classic incidence and prevalence data, you can start looking at your epidemic once you know about it and then case, count cases through time. But you can't go back and you know, retrospectively count. However, with sequences, you can reconstruct your phylogenetic tree and actually observe transmission events way before you sampled your sequences. And with HIV, for example, in the 90s, people sequenced human HIV as well as um, another virus called simian immunodeficiency virus, which is a button in different simian species, so different monkeys, and with the aim of identifying from where did this HIV come from. 
Then those people built a phylogenetic tree and saw that the main HIV strains circulating in the human population all are nested within a chimpanzee clade of SIV strains, meaning using genetic data, people could uh, conclude that HIV was uh, a zoonosis from chimpanzees, actually happening several times. It happened in Africa, that's where those chimpanzees live and where the first cases of um, HIV are, uh, later were uh, confirmed. And with modern phylogenetic tools, one can even also date this, those zoonoses, and uh, people date them now to the early 20th century. So um, here maybe I should add, I said HIV comes from chimpanzees, so there's also the second type of HIV, HIV-2, which is not very um, prevalent in the Western countries, but it is prevalent in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that comes actually from Suti manga bees. So it was a different zoonosis, which happened also a couple of times. So there were a couple of host jumps from um, those Suti manga bees into humans. So meaning for now years, phylogenetic tools were used for pathogen data in order to understand epidemics. And people reconstructed the trees and then read off from the trees, say, where, when and where did a zoonosis happen. And more recently, people then started to also ask about the dynamics of a pathogen spreading. So how fast does the pathogen spread? Um, can we make predictions in a week and two weeks how many people will be sick if we don't do interventions or if we do interventions? And uh, those dynamics were, for example, um, being estimated in the swine flu epidemic in 2009, where people estimate the so-called basic reproductive number, R0, and this will come up um, again in a talk, R0 for epidemiologists is a key quantity, and it tells you how many people on expectation one single infected individual makes sick. So say, I have a new influenza strain, and I now infect two of you. Then this R0 would be two, if two was also the expectation, how many people would have infected. And so here, for, for swine flu, it was um, estimated to be roughly 1.3, 1.4. And this approach to, to quantify transmission rates, or this R0, using genetic sequencing data has some limitations. So what you would probably think one should do is, the field of epidemiology is existing since 100 years, if not more, and people have very sophisticated models in that field. And one should use those models together with genetic sequencing data to quantify parameters of those models. What is done, though, mostly, is that in phylogenetics, due to mathematical convenience, People don't use those epidemiological models. Instead, though, use um, the so-called coalescent, the population genetic model, and infer, and this, the coalescent assumes some population size through time, and essentially people infer this population size through time and equal that to the number of infected through time. But there you make some approximations and assumptions that you can actually uh, project your epidemiological model onto the coalescent, which in certain circumstances can be um, rather problematic. And so our real goal is to use those epidemiological, more explicit epidemiological models and quantify their parameters. And this is what I'm now um, going to show you. So the overall idea, what we do or assume is, we first assume a population model. So how does the epidemic spread? Uh, uh, we have parameters for transmission and recovery. So in the simplest, it will be, um, say, a constant rate versus death process. You have a constant rate of transmission, a constant rate of recovery. And with those parameters, here summarized in ETA, you can simulate a tree, branching being birth and termination being death. And you get a probability distribution for trees given those parameters. The second component then you need is how do your genetic sequences, the pathogen sequences, change through time? So you assume some evolutionary model, some mutation model, be it um, a Schuch's Cantor model or more sophisticated, more general models, specifying how do the nucleotides change through time for your genetic sequences 
So then, given you start with the pathogen of this toy sequence at the root, this sequence accumulates mutations, and we end up with sequences towards at the tips of this tree, and we get a distribution of sequences given our evolutionary parameters theta and the tree. Now, obviously, we don't know theta and we don't know eta, these parameters, and we don't know the tree. What we know, though, is this alignment, the sequences. That's what we get as empirical data. So what we are now doing is um, we aim to infer the probability distribution of our parameters, the eta and theta, together with the phylogenetic trees, given the genetic sequences. And this is also called the posterior distribution. So we aim to infer our unknown quantities given the data. And this posterior typically can't be explicitly calculated. So one rewrites this quantity uh, using Bayes' theorem, which is kind of a basic um, uh, probability theorem. And anyways, when you rewrite that, you get the probability of the sequences given the theta and the tree, which is exactly what our evolutionary model describes. We get the probability of our trees, the transmission trees, given our transmission rates and recovery rates, with which the first model describes. And then we have priors on our parameters, which is typical for Bayesian methods. So you, the user can assume potential certain um, knowledge on those parameters, and we have a normalizing constant. And so once we then we assume some models have the quantities, those probability distributions, we can uh, implement all of that in an MCMC approach, a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, feed in then the sequences and get back the posterior distribution, so estimates for our parameters and the phylogenetic trees. And I am mainly interested in improving the quantity, the, um, the probability of the tree given those transmission and um, recovery rates. Because there I had the feeling what was being used, those coalescent approximations can, in uh, different cases, uh, fail and lead to severe biases. Okay. So what kind of models do we assume for the epidemic spread? Typically, people in epidemiology assume so-called compartmental models. So the simplest one being you have a compartment of susceptibles, infected, and recovered people. Now, and the dynamics between them is, the infected people have a rate of infecting the susceptibles, which we call here lambda, and a rate of recovering, which we call here delta. And so far, this is the most plain epidemiological model. Now we assume a probability p of sampling an individual meaning sequencing their pathogen and including them into the phylogenetic tree analysis. And such a model now gives rise to a whole transmission chain, so branching events being transmission events, tips in a tree being those recovery events, and tips with a cross being non-sampled events, and tips with an orange ball being sampled uh, pathogens. Now, obviously, well, um, we cannot know anything about our unsampled individuals, so we prune away from this complete transmission chain, the non-sampled individuals, and we end up with a phylogenetic tree connecting our samples, and this is precisely what we would aim at estimating from our genetic sequencing data. And now the question is, what is the probability of such a reconstructed phylogeny under our um, epidemic model, if we know that, we have the component or essentially we can determine those parameters best explaining the phylogenetic tree and then the overall thing will be done in the spatial framework where we infer all the trees together with the parameters directly. And here now, I mean, I showed you the simplest model, but now you can vary those parameters to time and, and can assume different rates for different types of individuals. Say, if you live in a different geographic location, you might have a different transmission rate or a different reco uh, recovery rate because you have different treatment accessible. So you can now generalize this model in different ways. 
for the very simple case where actually we only have infected individuals and they infect, so we have kind of a pure uh, or a constant rate burst death process without any saturation because there's a um, limitation of susceptible individuals, we luckily actually can write down the full um, probability um, distribution of trees analytically. And so we just then use those equations, put them into the MCMC framework, and then let this MCMC infer the transmission and recovery rates. And so over time, this is kind of the equation I showed is essentially a model where we can analyze epidemic outbreaks. So over time, then we added the fact that we have a limited number of susceptible individuals, so we shouldn't have uncontrolled growth, or we shouldn't assume uncontrolled growth, because this is unrealistic for an epidemic. There's only a finite number of people who can get infected. And epidemiological parameters may change through time, because, well, there may be public health interventions, we may change behavior, etc. And then, um, as briefly mentioned, the population may be structured, so different people in different courts may actually uh, undergo different dynamics. And all this is um, implemented um, as an um, uh, Bayesian tool in, in BEAST, so this is a very um, popular um, phylo, phylogenetic software tool, not implemented by us, but we essentially write the add-ons for different tools or different models, so we write add-ons for um, assuming different or uh, new epidemiological models, but using their machinery on doing the MCMC on trees and searching through tree space. And we also have some um, R implementations, but uh, once we know something works well, we actually put it typically into bees because it would be uh, more widely available. Yeah? Um, so far, not. That's actually something we are currently working on. If you have um, reticulation, say, if you look at bacteria and you have plasmid exchange or so. But um, so far, actually, there are no real, um, oh, well, there are no tools where you can really investigate the dynamical um, behavior of systems with reticulations. There are some tools giving you the reticulation network, but then not kind of the dynamics on it. Well, um, so I should repeat the question. So it was all now about um, reticulation, and the question being now, since there are no tools for the epidemiological models with reticulation, if it's an advantage of the coalescent, I'd so say, um, well, yes and no. There are some frameworks where you can allow for recombination in a coalescent, but they also, uh, well, that means breakdown if you're if you're a, Data size is getting um, to uh, sizes which we typically analyze. Only already only a whatever few hundred sequences, which you need to make really really good ethnological estimates. Then you can have well, very many recognition events, and the whole tools get very very slow. Um, and we are right now actually um, developing something as an analogon, kind of your birth death and recombination rates and trying to infer those rates. But I would say all those tools so far, including ours, are very slow and um, not mixed in certain circumstances, but then may break down for other data sets even. Good. So now that I showed you all this kind of theory behind how we um, define our models, what we do computationally, I want to show you um, an example. Uh, data set or data analysis we did um, on Ebola in West Africa, uh, which was mainly spreading um, all of 2014. Um, so it was mainly affecting, as you probably all read, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Sierra Leone and Guinea have still occasional cases. Now they are for, um, I think, two or three weeks uh, free of Ebola, so people hope now that actually it's also over there, but it's not um, totally confirmed yet. 
Um, there are more than 28,000 suspected cases and more than 11,000 deaths, so it was by far the biggest Ebola epidemic uh, which was ever spreading. And we were wondering now, can we use, so last, well, pretty much a year ago, um, well, end of August 2014, there was a paper published in Science. They analyzed uh, genetic sequences from uh, mainly Sierra Leone, and they aimed to determine where did, uh, when did Ebola start spreading, and was it one single zoonosis, meaning a jump of this virus from some animal into the human population. And so we thought we want to use exactly the same data and quantify this basic reproductive number, what I um, explained before, the number which characterizes how many secondary infections we have. So if it's two, one person infects an average two other people. And so we had 72 genomes from Sierra Leone, um, all sampled um, in May and June of 2014, so when it was really taking off in Sierra Leone. And what you see here is, um, here in blue shaded, our posterior distribution of this R0 for those 72 genomes um, in Sierra Leone, and it peaks roughly around 2. And what I show you here, just because we discussed this um, also before, the prior was in green for R0. So you see there is quite some signal in the data pushing the green prior assumption, which we just said was a median around 1 it was pushed to, towards something significantly higher, namely this blue shaded curve. If one would use a population genetic approximation, so the coalescent, one would get this orange curve, which you can see, I mean, it's in the same ballpark, but it is a very, definitely a differently shaped curve. And back then we tested, do we already see signs of saturation, meaning a slowdown of the epidemic? And back then we didn't see anything. And so we finished those analysis um, pretty much um, last October. And from then on, we're thinking, well, you know, now we characterize the very early spread of Ebola in Sierra Leone, but what the, did happen since the last samples were taken in June? And the main problem was that no new sequencing data was becoming available. The reason being that actually in all those countries, they had major problems of just taking care of the patients and the medical pe people and staff who actually uh, well, was working in the health sector and treating patients, a lot of them contracted Ebola themselves and um, among those also people who collected sequences while they were treating and sending them out for sequencing and um, from this paper which was published end of August 2014, by the time it was published, so just went to peer review already five of the co-authors working in those countries have died of Ebola. And so you can imagine from then onwards there was kind of a huge problem, there was not, not much new data, um, the epidemic was spreading a lot, and um, but then um, over time luckily, um, or finally, the WHO declared it as a um, um, public health emergency and um, some countries helped to some extent, and now also new sequencing data became available. In particular, um, we got new sequencing data, um, well, from two papers, which were um, both published this year. One paper had mainly Sierra Leone sequences in, and another paper mainly Guinea sequences. And so what we were doing then, was, so first I show you here now the Sierra Leone data set. We were reconstructing the phylogenetic trees. Here I show you one tree from the um, posterior distribution. And with this tree, you will infer for sure, well, the start of the epidemic, so the time it all took off, because that would be one parameter also of your um, model. And so we estimated that for March 2014 in Sierra Leone. Then we estimated the reproduction number through time. If it's not at the beginning of the outbreak, but through time, people call it the effective reproductive number rather than basic reproductive number. And so here you see, again, for early on, um, it's, uh, well, can be anything in the range of almost up to 2.5, and then it's dropping. And towards the end of 2014, it's um, significantly below 
one, and one is kind of this crucial threshold. So if the reproductive number is below one, one person infects on average less than one other person during the infection, so the epidemic will decline and eventually die out. So this, this looked good, it, it dropped below one. And then we also, with this method, because we have this, remember we have this parameter P, the sampling proportion, we can actually estimate how, what proportion of individuals do we have in our data set. And at the start, it was quite a lot of them. Um, one thinks roughly half of them. But then, obviously, once in Sierra Leone, this epidemic was spreading really, really f um, fast. And overall, we had here um, less than 300 sequences. We only had um, a small amount of the total number of cases. And we see here the sampling proportion actually to drop. And so to compare this now to um, what is known about the epidemic, well, the first suspect that the index case is uh, thought of December 2013. But this is in Guinea. The first confirmed case, March 2014, also in Guinea. So there's quite a lag time between where we, when we think there was Ebola, because people now interviewing them, they think it's people like Ebola, to the confirmed case. The first confirmed case in Sierra Leone was end of May. So you can imagine quite some time before was the first case. We here estimate it to be March. And then actually in August, um, this epidemic was uh, declared a public health emergency by the WHO. And then we see it dropped, but it's hard to say if it dropped after they declared it and did something or if it was already dropping before. The WHO also, when they declared that, they estimated the basic reproductive number and um, interesting or reassuringly, pretty much the same time we did the initial analysis, they also got roughly a two. And people now think also with totally other analyses, all or majorly based on incidence and prevalence data, people think really the basic reproductive number was around two. The second data set, so this is then now Guinea, where actually the whole epidemic started. We did exactly the same analyses. And here you see we estimate the origin of the whole epidemic to early December 2013, well, the, the, the maximum or, or peak in the posterior distribution, which very nicely agrees with the first suspected index case. And an important thing to see here, it seems the effective reproductive number in Guinea was throughout the epidemic lower than in Sierra Leone. And actually, when you look at the um, incidence curve, so this is WHO data, where it just counted through time the number of reported cases. Here in blue, you have Guinea. It looks significantly lower than um, Sierra Leone and Liberia. And from the phylogenetic analysis, with the same priors, everything being the same, you also get a lower reproductive number. We then were wondering how well did we actually infer the sampling proportion. And so remember I said we infer this P through time, how many cases did we sample, which allows us to calculate back how many total cases there were through time. And in purple, you see our estimated sampling proportion. And green is simply the number of samples divided by the number of confirmed cases, which should be an overestimate of the true sampling proportion, because probably there are some unconfirmed cases. The true sampling proportion is samples divided by overall cases, and we divide by confirmed cases. And you see the green line, green line to be at the upper end of this purple interval. So this was really reassuring that hopefully for epidemics where we don't have as good count data, we can estimate the uh, sampling proportion. Well, and um, to summarize here, the origin we estimated in Guinea for December 2013, Sierra Leone for March 2014, which is in agreement or earlier than the first confirmed cases. So it makes sense. With this, I want to leave um, um, uh, Ebola and just give you now kind of one idea what we are right now working and what we want to work in upcoming future with respect to epidemiology. So all those analyses we are right now assuming 
all individuals kind of behave dynamically in the same way. There is no structure in the population. But actually, there may be a lot of structure. So for one example, in pathogens, they may be drug resistant or drug sensitive. And for that reason, they may transmit more or less. So one theory is that drug resistant strains, they should have a disadvantage, otherwise they would be the wild type. And potentially, they are less good as being transmitted from one host to the next. And if we would know it, that certain drug resistances can never be transmitted from one host to the other, it would, of course, always be bad for the person having a drug resistance because he or she can't be treated. But we wouldn't have the danger of a secondary <coughs> resistant epidemic. If, on the other hand, we would know certain drug resistance are transmitted a lot, we should really, really avoid them with respect to the whole population because then we couldn't treat soon any people. And this is actually a very um, um, important topic, in particular um, in bacteria these days, that most antibiotics, oh, there are resistant strains against most antibiotics. And so we feel that with phylogenetics, we can actually answer, uh, one in principle can answer such questions because compared to incidence and prevalence data, you actually in phylogenetic trees see the past transmission structure. And so, for example, if drug resistance is transmitted, you would see whole plates of being red, meaning drug resistance. And if drug resistance only evolves de novo, you should only see, um, or you should see all those drug resistances emerging in different parts of the tree. And obviously in the tree, you don't have those red branches, but you can reconstruct everything up to the red branches because you would know if your sequence strains are drug resistant or drug sensitive. And so there should be signal from how those tips are colored, red or black, how they mix among each other towards how much drug resistance is transmitted or evolving de novo. And this is some, um, one question um, we are right now asking, so giving you some idea of, on how, what we are working now, in particular for tuberculosis, so bacteria, where it actually um, has a lot of, or a lot of different multi-drug resistant strains. And there we get data from Georgia, as well as um, looking into HIV, in particular the Swiss HIV um, cohort. And so with this little out, um, look in epidemiology, I want to now just um, briefly um, show you what we also do in those two other um, areas in macroevolution and single cells. And so in macroevolution, as I said, people typically infer species phylogenies by having some genetic sequencing data of extant species reconstructing the phylogeny and trying to understand what are transmission dynamics, ah, sorry, speciation dynamics, extinction dynamics. On the other hand, there's the whole field of paleontology where people look at fossils and pretty much asks the same question. How do species emerge? When do they go extinct? And often, the conclusions being made by phylogenetic studies contradict the conclusions being made by paleontological studies. And so the obvious thing would be, can we actually look at the different data sources together and somehow reconcile certain um, contradictions? Because at the end, both data sources, the extent species genetic data and the fossil data, is part of the same process of speciation and extinction. And so what um, we developed was, um, well, what we want to do is to bridge from phylogenetics towards paleontology. And we wanted to do that by developing a new tool where we essentially model the extant species data together with the fossil data simultaneously. And we do that um, with a model which we call the fossilized burst death process. And this is now very related to those burst death processes I showed you before in epidemiology. So even though it's a very different application, at the core of the methods, it's actually um, very, very related. What we now have at the core is instead of infected individuals, we have species. They speciate with some rate lambda, go extinct with a rate mu. And now, while those species live through time, 
they might produce fossils, which we then actually sample later with some rate psi. And so when you would do a simulation under this model, you would get those um, complete trees, where again the crosses are dead parts of the tree, so extinct species. The, now the dark red dots are fossil samples we obtained. And then at present we have in the, the light orange dots, which are the extant species samples, as well as the non-sampled um, tips. Again, we prune all the unseen um, um, lineages. So we obtain our reconstructed phylogeny, which we aim to infer using genetic sequencing data together with the fossils which are indicated in dark red. And now in order to infer such trees and um, estimate rates, we have to do exactly the same as before. We have to determine the probability of this full tree, while typically in phylogenetics one would, or in phylogenetics in species, one would only look at a tree with extant species. So we would include the fossils and um, ask what is the probability given the different uh, parameters. And so um, what we hope now is to get um, better estimates of our phylogenies, in particular with respect to dating speciation events, because um, in order to get an exact um, dating of when the chimpanzees and the humans or birds and mammals, etc., diverge, we always somehow need to um, superimpose some fossils where we know um, to which um, clade in the tree of life they belong to. And so in any case, we implement all those things, or this model now, together with the, um, well, we had available the molecular evolution model, and then for fossils we also use morphology and have morphological models. This is all available in beasts. So there the nice thing is we only have to do this kind of burst, fossilized burst dust model, add that. And so then we went and um, analyzed data. And the first data set we analyzed was a bear phylogeny. Here the aim was to simply infer the phylogeny using the fossilized burst dust process without you know, making any prior assumptions on where we think certain um, fossils fall or how the tree should look like. And encouragingly, without us knowing anything about bears, we got pretty much the tree people think of um, how the bear phylogeny should look like. So this was pretty much demonstrating that we thought, well, without being an expert, or in the lack of actually expert data, we could get uh, reliable phylogenies. So then for the next step, we went further and actually analyzed the data set where there is controversy, namely penguins. And so you see on the right-hand side here, the extent species penguins, and then um, in the circles, all those um, fossils of penguins. And the discussion is on, in the literature and among um, penguin experts, how old the radiation of modern penguins is. So what was the most recent common ancestor of all those extant penguins? And so people are, a lot of, um, People suggested that the radiation is actually not too young, so it might be at 20, 25 million years old. And when we now include fossils, only fossils which are which we know descended from those from this most recent common ancestor of modern day penguins, we actually get the same age. But once you include older fossils, which was actually um, for some methodological reasons not possible with uh, other methods, all of a sudden your age gets younger and younger, so there seems to be a signal that, you know, those ancestors, they were ancestors pushing this most recent common ancestor to some um, younger age, so we estimate now roughly 12 million years when we include all the fossils. But now we are talking um, more with some penguin experts on their different views on uh, those estimates. Yeah. <laughs> Rate, no? um, here, so we get pretty much the same results, so we also let that vary. So you can have it constant through time. That's actually a good question. I didn't uh, mention that before. In the bear data set, we didn't have the implementation yet that we could vary those rates, which is obviously um, 
a model misspecification, but here we can vary the rates through time, speciation, extinction, and fossilization, or leave them constant. What you observe with any of those methods, if you're just interested in the phylogeny, we never get, if the data is good, this prior on how the rates change doesn't influence too much the phylogenies. But once, obviously, you want to ask something about your speciation or extinction rate, and you don't, don't allow it to vary, then... Like empty space complaints, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so we did it that, that, um, pretty much both ways. So one way, like with say the Ebola, where we had those different layers, things could change. The, there it was the protective number. Here it was um, the different speciation, extinction, and fossilization rate, or they were constant. And the phylogeny as a whole, and the most recent condenses, they were the same. So now I want to end with just giving you a very brief idea of what, and this is something we just recently started working on um, in, uh, for single cells, how we can use phylogenetic tools for single cell analysis. And there actually um, Tim Schroeder, who is a professor in the department um, where I now work at, he um, looks at um, blood cells and wonders how differentiation in blood cell works. So in blood cells you have um, kind of stem cells which can which can, will, would replicate forever and can um, diversify into any other of the blood cells. And with their tools, they can pretty much sort their cells according to, they can get sets of cells where they're sure there's no stem cell in the set, or they can get a set where they have up to a 50%, um, say, accuracy. So they know 50%, roughly 50% of the cells should be stem cells, but we only not to 50%. We can't divide kind of the rest of the cells accordingly. So meaning, um, and the non-stem cells, or the next stage would be multipotent progenitor cells, so MPP cells. So we know here the right-hand side, those are not stem cells. Um, and what we display is the cell dividing under the mi on a plate under a microscope. And now we put here the division. Um, pattern of the cells, with crosses being death of the cell, and branch lengths being the time it takes until they divide. And on the left-hand side, you see this mixed set where they can, you know, pull out most of the cells. They're sure they're not stem cells, but they are left with a 50-50 mix of stem cells and MPP, multipotent progenitor cells. And their question was essentially, can we determine in this mixed set which trees have a stem cell origin. And what we then, um, in short, what, what we suggest is, yes, you can to some extent. What we were essentially doing was, um, you have here a set where you know it's not a stem cell. And you can assume some model. Here now we wouldn't assume rates until birth or death, but there's some kind of, no, it looks like there's some normal distribution might be a good model for the lifetime of those cells estimate those parameters for the MPP set. And now for each tree in a mixed set, we ask, is there significant support to uh, reject the parameters for the MPP set? And for 18% of those trees in a mixed set, there's significant support to reject them being part of this mixed set, uh, MPP set. So now um, we are uh, proposing that those 18% actually might be stem cells. The method is not super accurate yet because we missed 32%. But now um, it's back to um, our collaborators, and they now have to verify if actually those 18% are stem cells. And that's actually a um, very um, annoying word because um, so those blood cells, I mean, the group is mainly interested in human blood differentiation, but the experiment are a lot done on mice cell lines. And so to now confirm if a cell is actually um, a stem cell, you would need or you need to put it back into the mouse and see if it's replicating and not differentiating for months and months. And then you're really sure this was um, a stem cell and can confirm or say we were totally wrong about this. But that it's so tedious to actually say what is a stem cell, and they need that for doing experiments, it's, 
it would be great to have a tool where you can actually characterize those things. And so, but there I should say also other people in the department work on um, things and you can also now add expression data and other markers to essentially improve on your characterization. So with just a little um, stem cell um, excursion, I am um, at the end. I hope I gave you um, kind of an overview of what we are doing. If you have any questions, comments, um, have them there now or uh, at another point in time. And with this, I want to thank um, in particular um, my group and then all the different funding agencies um, supporting us. And thank you for coming. And I'm happy to take any questions.